Rohit Sharma. I'm the Associate Trauma Director here. I'm an acute care surgeon, uh, and uh, most of my time is spent doing trauma. The purpose of this class is really to, to try to get as much information out there about what we can do to limit the impact bleeding has. So this initiative, the Stop the Bleed course, started with the Obama White House after we recognized the fact that we were having so many mass casualties you know, the, the gunshots and you know, all, all the, the, the things that we deal with now on an almost weekly basis. And that there was a basic, there's a lack of basic knowledge of what to do in the trauma setting. Very similar to the way we started teaching basic life support, BLS, right, to civilian people. Um, because someone who knows how to do CPR buys you minutes until the medics come and take over from there. Very similar strategy to say, can we teach our, our people, our population, some basic steps on what to do if they, if they come across someone who's injured? And so this has been a wild, wildly successful program, and so we're really proud to offer that here. We started this program three years ago now, I think, right, 2017? Almost as, like, as a, an experiment, we taught the Santa Barbara Police Department the Stop the Bleed course. We were planning on doing one or two of them, but they loved it and they wanted us to come back and back, you know, come back again. And so from that extension, we started teaching a lot of the in-hospital providers, and now we're, we're rolling out to anybody who's interested in learning. And so please tell your friends, we'll, we'll have more of these classes. If you're interested in being an instructor, just please tell any of us after we do this little seminar, um, and we can put you into an instructor training course, which is very simple. So everybody signed on. You know, This is the, from the, the upper echelons of the people who take care of trauma, trauma patients. So again, some of the stuff that we're going to talk about, some of the images and some of the techniques, you know, ob obligatory, this is going to be on patients who are injured, and so we have some videos. I don't know if they're going to work, but if they do, great. Otherwise, we'll, we'll show you guys later. So this is really why. The number one cause of, preven of preventable injury after trauma is hemorrhage, right? If you ask any person who's done a trauma course, the number one, two, and three causes of death are hemorrhage, hemorrhage, and hemorrhage, right? So as a good example, the, the victims who were shot in the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, right? The autopsy studies have shown that 30% of them died from extremity wounds that they would be alive today if we had a tourniquet, right? So it's a very, very, you know, you don't need a dramatic injury to bleed to death from. And so that's why this training is very important. And it's, you know, we think about the mass casualty. We think about the Isla Vista shooting. We think about Columbine. We think about those things. But the reality is these types of fatal injuries don't have to happen in a dramatic polytrauma sense, right? There's a lot of guys who have bandsaws in their garage, you know, or a motorcycle crash where you injure your foot. You know, there's a lot of construction, the oil rigs out there. So the, the number of ways that bleeding can occur is infinite. And so that's why this knowledge is infinitely applicable. It's not just about the school shooting thing that we all worry about, right? So the key steps are going to be identifying someone you think has life-threatening bleeding and then instituting very simple steps to try to mitigate that, slow it down, stop it until um, ambulances and first responders come, right? So uh, first and foremost, uh, particularly for the, the non-medical providers, you need to make sure you don't become a victim. Right. If this is a car crash on the side of the freeway, don't run into the freeway to try to save somebody and then become a victim getting tagged. Right. You can't help somebody else if you are also injured. So making sure you're safe is a, is a high priority. Because if you're injured, you can't help anybody else. When you can do so, go in and help. Um, but again, you got to make sure everything is safe. Um, and if, if the situation changes, you know, cars are flying by you again, you got to stop, reassess the, the situation before you try approaching again. If you can, take the victim with you, you know, bring them with you, get them out of the danger, and then stabilize them, but if that's possible. Um, also, it's very important, you know, it's, we're in the age of bloodborne contaminants and bloodborne diseases, and so <laughs> making sure you're safe, um, having personal protective gear. So if you, now that you are interested in this class, I would highly encourage you guys get, you know, keep a, some, a couple pairs of gloves in the trunk or one in your purse kind of thing in case that need or is a, uh, comes up. Um, so gloves, if you have them. If you get blood on you, particularly on intact skin, that's okay. You know, we're, we get blood on us all the time in the hospital. As long as your skin is intact, that's not that big a deal. It's when you have breaks in the skin, lacerations, or it gets into your mucous membranes or eyes that there's a risk of, of contamination, even though the, the risk of contamination is very low. 
Um, but if you get it, tell the first responders, come to the hospital, we'll, we'll take care of you, right? Wash it off as soon as you can, tell everybody else. So first step in taking care of anybody who's injured, particularly if you're the only person who is able to provide help, is to get more help, right? So if you're, you know, for the police department, I just have them tell them to call on their walkie-talkie, call for help, then jump in, right, be the hero. But for us, for us civilians, calling 911, getting the resources there is paramount, right? Because if you're the only person, you have five, five victims, you need, you know, how do you triage that? That's a whole different scenario. So get as, get as much help as possible. So that's either, you know, push the button in the mall or the little, you know, call 911 thing if you're on campus or call 911. So get as much help there as you can. We recommend calling 911. Um, know where you are, tell the, tell the instructors. And then you gotta figure out where they're bleeding and what you could potentially do to lessen that, right? So what are some things that you would look for if, to identify someone who has life-threatening bleeding? It's just shout it out. Blood. So a little bit of blood, like I cut myself shaving. Sure, pulsatile bleeding, right? Spurting blood. I say if it looks like a Quentin Tarantino movie, the person has life-threatening injuries, right? So what else? Soaked clothes. Clothes, yeah, clothes soaked in blood. Maybe it's not active hemorrhage, but clearly there's a big puddle around them. They're soaked, right? What are some subtle things that we think about? Maybe their behavior has changed in some way. Like what? Well, if they're unconscious or... Alter mental status, yeah. right? Your brain is a very sensitive organ to blood loss, right? So hypotension, low blood pressure, low blood volume, blood loss, they're not acting right, you know? And we, we see that all the time in the ER. Someone comes in and they're acting kind of goofy and you're not sure, is it because they've, they're hemorrhaging or is it because they're intoxicated? Or do they have underlying dementia? Or do they have a concussion? You know, these sorts of things that we filter out. But again, the onus is on us to say, this is bleeding and not, they're just drunk, right? Drunk is drunk, bleeding is death, right? So the air on the side is the thinking of hemorrhage up front. So yeah, altered mental status, they're pale, they're cool, they're clammy, they're probably not gonna be doing a whole lot, right, if they're really severely hypotensive. Um, big puddle, clothing soaked, injuries that would suggest that uh, they have had a lot of uh, blood loss. Perfect. So again, continuous bleeding, the pulsatile, or even the slow ooze, slow steady ooze, um, that can all add up, right? Um, and then a pool of blood, that sort of thing, everything that we talked about. And again, everything adds up. You have a cut here, you have a cut there, you have a broken humerus, you have a little, you have a splenic injury, it all adds up, right? So the blood loss is cumulative. Um, and you know, we don't necessarily see this as much, but like on the East Coast or anywhere where they have real weather, right? The, the people with the big puffy jackets that, that can conceal a lot of bleeding until you reveal that, right? So again, someone is altered, someone's hypotensive, the default is to, to say this is ongoing hemorrhage until proven otherwise. And that's true in hospital as well. That's the way that we teach our, our trauma courses to all the residents and surgeons and ER docs and trauma people. The rule out blood loss, everything else is less important. Questions so far? Good. So now that we know what to look for on bleeding, the understanding of what you can do, how you're gonna, what techniques you have to address bleeding very, very based on where the bleeding is, right? So we talk about extremity injuries, right? So a distal to the armpit, so axilla and beyond, or distal to the groin, right? So arms and legs is what we're talking about. Those are injuries that are very, are, are easiest treated with things like tourniquets, right? Because you can get above the injury. When you transition to things, that, the junctional zone, so the, the picture with the green, where the extremities meet the torso, so your armpits, your groin, your neck, you can't get a tourniquet around that area, right? It's much harder to do, and so you have other techniques that we can employ. Right? And then lastly, the, the red zone, the trunk zone, right? Chest, abdomen, pelvis, no amount of external compression or tourniquet or wound compression is gonna stop that bleeding. That, those patients need operative intervention, right? So the focus really is on those extremities and junctional wounds. So the first step, the easiest step, the thing that requires no fancy tools is direct wound compression, right? So you put your body weight onto the wound, that will almost always stop the bleeding, right? 
when we have a patient who's injured and we're in the OR and we have the abdomen open and they're gushing blood, what we do is we put weight onto the aorta, right, the big artery that comes out of the heart. And I just have somebody compress it and that stops the bleeding. So that will, if that works for the aorta, that will definitely work for the calf, right? That will definitely work for the arm. And you don't need a tourniquet, you don't need anything fancy. You need a hand, you need some body weight, you need direct compression, right? And you're doing wound compression because you think this person has life-threatening bleeding. And the way this works, any of these interventions that you employ, once it's on, it's on, right? You don't take it off and see if they're still bleeding. You don't take it off and see if, you know, once it's on, it's on. That's why it's paramount that you call 911 before you do anything, especially hands-on, right? Because you're committed to that compression, right? If you're stuck in the desert and it's you and a victim and your arms tire out and you have to let go and the person bleeds to death, that's the worst case scenario, but that's why we get help, right? So compression is as simple as possible. Get, get your fingers, get your hand, get your weight directly onto the wound and do as much pressure as you need to stop the bleeding. The easiest is just to lock your arms and then give full body weight compression. That will stop any, any kind of bleeding. Focus on the location of the bleeding. So, you know, it's like when they, they tell you to treat the base of the fire rather than the flames, right? You focus on what's burning. So focus on the laceration, not the, not the torrent of blood coming down, um, and then compress. And if it stops bleeding, great. That's as much pressure as you need. You keep it on board until help arrives and they can, they can take over from there, right? If you have, if you have gauze, if you have, if you have cloth, that's great, a gym towel, you can use that to help compress. It's not location dependent, right? And so, you, because you need to stop the bleeding. And so, it's gonna hurt, it's not gonna feel great. There are some areas of the body that are more sensitive than others, but that's how it is, right? Because you're treating life-threatening hemorrhage. So, direct wound compression is gonna be your key. Your go-to, the easiest, less, you don't need anything technical. You just put, put your weight onto it. If you have a gym towel, you have an extra shirt, you got some socks, you know, to help augment that pressure, that's perfect. For some deep wounds, you can put all the pressure that you want, but that pressure is not being transmitted to the area that's bleeding, right? If you have a deep vessel, you have a, you have a thigh laceration, the vessels are very deep, and if someone is trying to push down on it, you may not transmit that force because you're not getting to the area that's bleeding, right? So in situations like that, wound packing is going to be a very important technique. And so this figure shows it really well. If you look at the bottom panel with the X, a person may be trying to provide good pressure good external compression here, but that isn't being transmitted to the bottom of the, the base of the wound where the vessel actually is. And so packing a wound, shoving whatever you have, we have gauze, but if you don't have that gauze, you put in whatever you have, a t-shirt, gym towel, extra socks, whatever. Pack the wound tightly, and then that will allow you to better transmit that force down to the base of the wound. The way I, I, I tell people, it's like when you're trying to get the sleeping bag back into the bag that the sleeping bag came with, right, and you just keep shoving, just keep packing that wound until it's full, and then you put compression on it, right? And don't be surprised when these wounds take a lot of packing. You know, the wounds can be bigger than you think. So pack it, compress it, very simple, right? Question so far? So external compression will work almost anywhere. Wound packing is really key for the junctional areas because you can't get a tourniquet above it. Direct compression and packing will help with anywhere. Um, the arms, legs, neck, groin. The trunk is very hard to do because usually the bleeding is internal and you can't get deep enough without operative exposure. Um, again, so for the external, the key is going to be the tourniquet, which we're going to get to now. Junctional areas, direct compression and wound packing are going to be all you got. And then for the torso, it's get them to the OR as fast as possible. The last thing uh, is going to be tourniquets, right? So. We're, well, everyone's going to practice with the tourniquets. You'll practice on a partner. You'll practice on yourself, and that way you get you get some hands-on experience on it. The tourniquets fell out of vogue for a while in the trauma community, and then with our latest experiences with the Middle East wars, we these really have become a game changer with the way we treat injured people, right? Somewhere around Korea and Vietnam, people thought once you once you put a tourniquet on, you know, even though the person may be shot, that leg is going to have to go. Right, so they fell out of vogue for a while. It was a four-letter word that we didn't use in the trauma community, but that was foolhardy because we know tourniquets save lives. You know, and there's a very simple dogma in trauma care: it's life before limb, limb before looks. Right, so if you're taking care of someone who's got life-threatening hemorrhage, you do what you need to, do to stop that hemorrhage. It may cost them a leg, unfortunately, but that is better than being dead. 
The reality is we use tourniquets every day. If anyone's ever total knee replacement, you've had a tourniquet on in the OR. You know, we do it all the time. We bleed, we wrap your leg out, exsanguinate it out of all of its blood, put a tourniquet up, it's a bloodless feel, they can take their time, it takes an hour or two to get the knee done, and that's fine. We know you, get, you start to have damage at about six hours. So most of the people that we take care of with tourniquets will be already in the definitive care center by then. You know, we have a wide region here in Santa Barbara. We accept a lot of people with helicopters and transport time, sure, it can be 45 minutes. That's not gonna cost anybody a leg. Where I did my trauma training in, in UCLA, in, in, the, in LA, the average time from scene to an ER was eight minutes. You're not gonna lose a leg because of a tourniquet with that. You know, maybe if you're flying from Alaska to Seattle because you don't have a vascular surgeon and that's a three hour transit, different story again, but that's the way things go sometimes. So don't be afraid that you're gonna cost somebody a limb by throwing a tourniquet on, you're saving their life. The way it works is you identify they have an injury, you put the tourniquet above the injury, right? And you crank it down until the bleeding stops. Once the bleeding is stopped, you leave the tourniquet on. That's how tight it needs to be. It's going to hurt. You'll all feel it. Your hand's going to go numb. It's going to tingle. It's going to feel like that my arm fell asleep sensation to level 10. But again, you're doing this to save somebody's life. Um, you can do it to yourself, right? A lot of the, our armed forces, especially in the high risk areas, will pre-place tourniquets on their four extremities. So if they get injured, they lose a leg, they, can, they don't have to try to put it on already. It's already there. They can crank it down themselves. Um, and sometimes you need to put a second tourniquet on, right? So you put one on, it took, it took, a, took care of 90% of the bleeding, and then you put a second one on top to add the little cherry on top. Um, it can be applied over clothes, but the best option is to place it directly against the skin, right? We don't worry about that as much here because it's temperate climate, everything is very nice, but in areas where you have people have big bulky jackets or, you know, like you have a couple of layers of long johns on, that will eliminate some of that pressure and you don't want that. You want to have good effective compression. So best is tourniquet directly onto skin. And of course, you don't want it over a joint, right, because the bones will prevent you to get good compression. So. You know, if you have a laceration at your forearm and a couple set inches above that puts you at the elbow, go above that or go above the knee. Right? You need to get good soft tissue compression. Um, and similarly, you know, make sure it's not on an iPhone or a bunch of keys or something or a watch. Right? You want to get good compression on the tissue. That's why I was endorsed. Just make sure it's tourniquet on skin and nothing else. You know, the yoga pants, the leggings, that's not that big a deal, but the big bulky stuff is a very big deal. There are a couple different types of uh, commercially available tourniquets. The combat application tourniquet, the CAT, the CAT is the one that we endorse and the one that we, we use and it, this is essentially the standard of care. We stole it from the military like all good trauma surgeons do. Um, and so if you're gonna buy it online, we'll tell you some reputable providers. There's a couple of cheaper, like Amazon has a bunch of like cheap knockoff stuff from China. They're not as good, they're not as durable and they're not trustworthy. So we'll tell you where to get it from. So the, the combat application tourniquet has a rod. You crank it until the bleeding stops. Everything that you can do to an adult, you can do to a child, irrespective of age, irrespective of size, right? So wound compression will almost always work and to, to control the hemorrhage of, uh, of an adult patient it will almost definitely work on a pediatric patient. They have lower blood pressures, less force to fight against, right? So you can do a direct compression, you can do a wound packing, you can do tourniquet application, just like anything else. Old, young, doesn't matter. So some things that we always get asked. So if there's an object that's impaled, right? We have construction, people fall off of roofs, they land on rebar, they land on fence posts, all that stuff, leave it in place. Right? We leave it in place until the person's in the OR and we have exposure. Because right? so, if you take it out and now that fence post was you know, holding back a torrent of blood and you've unleashed it and you can't get control on the inside, it's game over. So if anything is impaled, leave it in place. Put the tourniquet above it. Right? Improvised tourniquets aren't as good as something designed for compression. Right? A monkey wrench is good if you, you're using it for what monkey wrenches are designed to do. Right. You can use it as a hammer, but a hammer is better to, for that application, right? You're not going to worry about losing a limb. You're not going to worry about that, right? 
it's going to hurt. You warn the victim that this is going to hurt. I'm sorry, I have to do this because otherwise you're going to bleed to death. Any questions about that? Any questions about like the if you have any, like, direct compression? Just pressure. That's it. Yeah, trauma surgery is very simple. You put your finger in the hole and then put a stitch in the hole. So it, it works on your. It works. That's what we do in the ER. You know, we don't have anything fancy. We put cotton gauze on and we hold pressure, right? So that's always going to be your go-to if the victim has an injury to the extremities, you can also do tourniquets. But you can always do wound compression and you can almost always do wound packing. Just to... Sure, so if you're, if you're providing an intervention but they're still bleeding underneath, yeah, yeah you gotta figure out why it's not working. Yeah, put more pressure. Yeah, so you know, either it's not packed in deep enough. When we see that, we'll pack it and the blood will come through, it'll well through and we take it out, repack it. Yeah, because what, you, what you're doing, you gotta make sure it's effective. They may, they may die anyway, right, if they're injured enough and you're doing the best you can. It happens to us all the time and we have all the fancy tools, right? We have all the operative techniques. But if it's, if it's not working, something's not right. If it's soaking up, then you need to go back in and find Yeah, it pull it off, take a look, again, you know, because that, that's not you peeking to see if they stopped. It's, hey, my technique isn't working. My tourniquet's not tight enough. My wound packing isn't tight enough. Maybe I'm not putting enough pressure. That's a different scenario, yeah, yeah. Questions? So first step, call 911, get some help. Second, most easiest, least technical is just to put pressure on the wound. If it's a small laceration with a pulsatile artery, like I, I, had, a get, I had a gentleman who cut his foot, you know, and he dropped, he dropped a glass thing, it slid his foot, and he would lacerated the artery to the foot. It was one finger is all it took, but he nearly bled to death, you know. So he came in with a tourniquet because the medics did the right thing and put a tourniquet up, and when we took it off, we put a finger on it, and that was it. It wasn't full body compression, it was targeted pressure. But if you don't know, you know, we know the arterial anatomy, you can do that directed compression. But otherwise, you just grab onto the foot and hold it. That's all you need to do, right? Wound compression is gonna be the easiest. If you have gloves, that's great. Plastic bags work just as well. You know, I've done that as well. And then if it's a junctional injury and you're having trouble getting good compression or in a deep extremity injury where you're worried your compression isn't transmitting, then wound packing is gonna be key. Stuff it with whatever you have. Don't worry if, if you just finished a workout and you're using your sweaty shirt, we'll take care of the infection. We have antibiotics, we'll, we'll fix that. Can't fix bleeding with antibiotics though, right? And then lastly, the tourniquets, right? So the basic idea is it's a Velcro loop, right? So you put the loop on and you tighten it as much as you can. So I crank it and then you seal the Velcro down. And then there's a rod that you crank down that gives a little cherry on top for the pressure. So the tighter the first application of the Velcro, the better, the, the fewer rotations you'll need on the rod, right? So get, to get some practice doing that. Once the technique's on, you leave it on unless it's not working and you have to figure out why. And you can do multiple techniques, right? You're holding on to the, you're doing compression, your buddy's running out to the car, he's grabbing your tourniquet, then you throw the tourniquet on, then you can let go, now your hands are free and you move on to the next, move on to the next victim. Right, you can pack a wound, put direct compression on it, and you know, move on. You know, the military guys will put their whole body weight on. Instead of putting their hands, they use their knees. Right, you lean on, you kneel on the guy's wound because their hands need to be free to defend themselves with their weapons. Right, so whatever you need to do to stop that bleeding is totally fair game. Mm -mm. Yeah, you can get complete cessation of blood. That isn't true if you have bone breaks, you can still get slow oozes, but that's where packing the wound can help as well. Tourniquet above, pack the wound directly, and that, that'll stop the blood. So um, further resources can be available on the website, bleedingcontrol.org or stopthebleed.org. So if you're interested in being an instructor, let us know, we can help check you off, and then you can get all the stuff, these pamphlets and everything like that, publicly accessible. All they want you to do is sign up for an account and then you can print it out and you can go and you know teach your teach your youth group you know teach your you know ninja class whatever you want to do you know so that way you can promote promote this information this isn't proprietary the, there's a little bit of a capital investment that we had to buy the little mannequins and stuff but the more the people know how to do this the better off we're going to be and they sell little kits now bleeding control kits um, you can get it through the Stop the Bleed website and all these like American Red Cross and stuff, they have them as well. It's a little pouch, it's got a tourniquet, it's got some gloves, it's got some of the combat gauze that we have and for, you know, co uh, cotton gauze. And so that way you, know, you can throw it in your car, if you go hiking, throw it in your backpack, it's a little pouch. Um, it's got all the tools in there.